It's now my great pleasure to introduce our second keynote speaker of the day, Mia Ridge. Uh, Mia is, I think, originally from Melbourne. Um, she's well known to many in the NDF community. Um, she's had residencies at the Powerhouse and the Cooper Hewitt, so she's uh, well known to people like Seb Chan, who have been in uh, NDF community for a long time. Um, she's also been the lead developer at the Science Museum Group in the UK. You're now very close to completing your PhD, and I'm sorry we're getting in the way of that. Uh, Digital Humanities at UK's Open University uh, to focus on historians and crowdsourcing. This work builds on her, recent in, uh, her research interests in user experience design, human computer interaction, open cultural data, audience engagement, crowdsourcing, and much more in the cultural and heritage sector. All of these are highly relevant to what we're doing. Uh, in today's talk, Mia is talking about particip participatory commons. Um, and it's a framework that seems to seems sounds to me like it's capable of pulling a lot of a lot of what we do together um, into some sort of collective whole. So, over to Mia. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm actually quite honoured to be here because NDF is one of those conferences that people come back raving about. Um, so I'm very glad to be here. Um, I wanted to put up this question um, just to kind of uh, have it in mind. I'm going to tell you some stories. Um, some of them are going to celebrate how far we've come to mark the difference that decisions that New Zealand has made about open content compared to some of the international um, sector. And the stories are also to remind us that ultimately our work is about people. It's not about licensing rights, it's not about metadata, it's about the people that are contained in those records. So I'd like to ask what would happen if we, what could we create if we came together, if we ignored those um, boundaries between institutions, if we invited members of the public, both expert and novice, um, to come and work with us on improving our collections. So, some stories about some people from the past. Um, okay, this is Albert Henry Bailey. He was born and went to school in Dublin, um, but by the time the First World War broke out, he was a store manager in New Zealand. Um, we can tell from these records that he had um, he was fair complexion, blue eyes, red hair. Um, we've even got his weight, his height, he was five foot ten. Um, one of his medical records tells us that he was at the Trentham camp at one point, travelled to Egypt in a convoy of three ships with about 1,700 men. Um, they travelled the same route over February, March 1915. So we know something about him, but we're no closer to understanding his experience of the war. Um, we have letters from another, say, another soldier on the same ship. Um, this soldier, um, Ralph John Newton, talks about the food that they ate. Um, he talks about how they looked after the horses, they had to wash them down with seawater, they had to try and exercise them on board the ship. Um, he talks about a death at sea on one of the other ships in the convoy. Um, he talks about flying fish, dolphins, about crossing the equator. Um, we've got all this because the letters that he wrote to his parents uh, have been saved and are publicly available. Things changed when they got to, um, to their first engagement in the war. We know something of the experience of these men from other letters again. Um, this is a letter from um, William Henry Winter, who actually he died the same day as Bailey. Um, so. We don't know what Bailey went through. There's no, he's left no documentary traces, but we do have a sense of the kinds of experiences that he had. Um, because Australia and New Zealand have made their unit diaries publicly available in the Australian War Memorial, um, we can get the official unit diary for the day that they died. Um, the list of those killed that day runs to four pages. There's something about reading the actual documents that gives you a real sense of that loss um, and of the number of human lives. So in some sense, we've gone from bare data, we've gone from um, a few database fields to some sense of their lived experience of that war. We could only do this because these records were made publicly available. They're not hidden behind a paywall. They were made findable. So people who've worked on SEO, they've worked on database structures, they've made those things. They've put a lot of effort into actually making it so you can do a Google search and find these records. And they've made them available in a format that can be collected while you're researching. So I've made little dossiers about um, the various men that I'm researching. England has made different choices about their digitization strategies. So I tried to conduct a similar search for a different um, Albert Bailey. 
He was born and bred in England. He enlisted in England. Um, so the Commonwealth War Graves Commission has records online. So from these records, um, I learned that he was 33. He was married. Um, his wife lived in Nottingham. Um, but the census records, the newspapers, the birth, death, marriage certificates that I could access for Australian and New Zealand soldiers aren't available in the UK. So I very quickly kind of ran into um, a blank. I, don't, I can't retrieve much of his experience online because I don't have the context of what his life was like before he went into the army. Um, so I could look at um, the New Zealand Elwood Bailey and look at where he was living, think about, you know, he was in a cavalry troop, how did he learn to ride a horse if he was a store manager? Um, for this guy, all I know is that he was in the cyclist corps. I don't know where he was working, if he joined up with workmates, if he joined up with people from his village, why he was in the cyclist corps. I don't have any context for his experience. So even if I find other records online, other accounts, it's hard to relate them to him because I don't have those hooks that tell me more about him. Um, this is partly because the um, World War II destroyed a lot of the records from World War I. Um, so the survivability of records is always um, a variable in how much research you can do. But I really quickly ran into paywalls. Um, so these records have been digitised in partnership with commercial companies like Ancestry, like Find My Past. There's an argument that they're actually privatising personal lives. So these are our grandparents, our ancestors, um, people who share cultural experiences, at least in terms of um, British colonies. We can't access their records, we can't access their lives, unless you're willing to pay for it. And as a student, I'm not. Um, so it also gets very expensive if you're researching not just family history, but if you're doing the kind of research I'm doing, where I'm trying to look at the experiences of a lot of people over the course of the war. Individually getting certificates and access adds up really quickly. So the kinds of fine-grained historical work that people are trying to do isn't as accessible to these projects that are geared solely towards commercialising family history. OK, but why did I want to access all these records? So unlike family historians who are generally trying to look at just one or two people, um, I was trying to provide context for the wider experience of the war, to really understand for people who'd been in similar places at similar times, can we get some kind of proxy sense of their experience by looking at records from other people in the same situation at the same time. What battles had they been through? Um, what was the landscape like? Were they somewhere where it was really muddy? Were they somewhere where it was really hot? Um, had they been at the front line long? Were they with a troop that was experienced or were they with a troop that had no experience of the war yet? So I was trying to look at whether you could computationally generate context, because something like the centenary of the First World War is bringing lots of new historians into doing family history research or just doing research on people in their street, um, looking at the experience of people from the same place as them or with the same kind of occupation, whatever. It's actually really difficult to get into this research because there's a lot of jargon, there's a lot of military administration to understand. Um, and then you keep running into these paywalls. So I was um, trying to look at these records as part of um, work on the participatory commons. What is that? Um, I'm glad you asked. Um, but first of all, I want to take a step back and introduce you to some people. These are composites, um, or personas if you're user experience kind of person. Um, but they're based on my research, and I actually keep meeting people who are like these um, personas which is a good sign. So we have two um, archival historians. Um, Simone uh, works in a primary school, so she likes to continue her historical research because she can only do it in the school break. So she travels to an archive. She photographs the crap out of everything that she can. She takes notes from some things. She comes back, and then she sorts through her piles of documents. Luckily, she's in an archive where you can do that because you can't take photographs in all archives. Um, she's often working next to another historian, Andre, who's an academic historian. Um, they've never had a conversation because they're not that kind of person. Um, but they're actually working on really similar material and they could probably swap things around. Um, Andre's previous project actually really relates quite strongly to Simone's current project. He's published everything he wants to publish out of his little stash of archival documents. So he would quite happily hand them over, but they've got no way of making that connection. 
Um, so every day they come into the archive, they do this highly skilled work of contextualising and assessing documents, but they leave at the end of the day and they take all that knowledge with them. So Martha and Bob retired, they moved out to a village outside of London, um, and they joined their local history society as a way of getting to know other people in the village and getting a sense of what the village was like. Um, their local history society is one of those that makes projects for themselves. Um, so they're doing a project on looking up all the names on the memorial, the Great War Memorial in the village, um, and finding out the lives of those men who are listed there. And they're also doing a project where they're looking at um, how the war affected the village generally. So how did, did women go to work? Did it change what was available? Um, their secretary of the local history society did a local history course, so he's got an Excel database and they all kind of send in their records into the database. And then we have Daniel. Daniel has one of those classic shoebox archives. It's literally a shoebox that he keeps in the cupboard. Um, it's his grandfather's letters and diaries. One of the things about the First World War is that censorship was really quite strong and people were in an honour system not to give away too much information. It was actually illegal to damage morale. Um, so these were secret diaries and, um, that he kept with him through the war and then kind of they've stayed in the family ever since. Um, Daniel always wants to kind of find the time to transcribe these and leave them for his kids so that they can see on a map or some other kind of visualisation where their great-grandfather went, what happened to him during the war. Um, but he's busy raising kids and working and he hasn't done this yet. Finally, we have Nisha. Um, she's a classic kind of procrastinator transcriber, so she's got a couple of young kids. Um, when they've gone to bed, she'll have a glass of wine and she'll transcribe some records on this site called Old Weather, which is, um, strictly speaking, a citizen science or a climate science project that is transcribing ship's logs to get historical weather data that can be used by climate scientists. But these ship's logs also contain all kinds of sort of juicy little historical notes about other ships they saw, encounters that they had, things that happened at sea. Um, so she enjoys feeling like she's doing something for science, but she also enjoys that sense of little strange encounters in the logs. Um, and just to take, someone has actually already mentioned crowdsourcing, which is handy, but just to define it. Um, I think particularly in uh, cultural heritage, crowdsourcing, we don't pay people. Um, in a way, it's very much like people are volunteering. It's just a sexier form of volunteering in some ways. Um, but the tasks that we give people have to be meaningful. So it's not just busy work, it's not just tell us what you think about this exhibition and we'll throw it in the bin later. It's you have to be contributing to a common shared goal or some kind of meaningful research question. Um, it's really easy to say that participation should be rewarding for everyone, but it's actually quite difficult for institutions sometimes to have that really keen-eyed focus on um, the experience of a member of the public because it means giving them a seat at the table and involving them, or at least um, advocating for their experience when you're making decisions internally. So none of our friends know it, but they're all working in ways that could help each other. Um, if Andre and Simone were actually able to share their documents, then they'd both be better off. Um, Daniel's uh, diaries contain information that would be really useful for the historians, it would be really useful for Martha and Bob. Um, and Nisha would quite happily transcribe things for them if she was in, t in contact with them. Um, she could also start to mark up the dates and places that would help Daniel generate the map to show his kids. So you can probably guess this is all going somewhere. Um, but first of all, I wanted to bring in a new player, um, the cultural institutions. So far, New Zealand, I think, is doing really well. Um, it's easy to find content. You can usually access it easily. Um, there's all kinds of community work going on. Um, I love that this is in the um, about section of the National Library, um, connecting, collecting, co-creating. I don't know how it works in reality, you guys can tell me, but I think it's a brilliant statement to have up there as a goal. But it's not always easy to find structured data. Um, so current services are really good for like handcrafted queries. You can kind of Google around and find a diary here and another diary there. Um, but they're all in slightly different formats. It's difficult to kind of pull them in consistently into a document or into a database. 
For my current project, I really need lists of battalions for all the Allied forces. And I know because I've talked to people here, it's actually very difficult to get one for New Zealand. Um, it's difficult for almost every country, um, partly because there's a lot of battalions um, and they changed over time. But it's also, I think, that no one institution has ever needed to produce a list of battalions, a kind of definitive authority list of here are all the battalions that we know about, including the medical corps and all kinds of other things. Because we base our collections records on our collections. And if we don't need to record something about a particular unit, it's not going to be there. Um, so we don't have those kind of comprehensive structured data sets that would make things like computational history or digital history easier. And I think digital history methods only become transformational when they work at scale. Um, so you need to get beyond individual queries on institutional collection sites and move up into large-scale large scale queries. Um, something more like a historical gasset here would be quite useful in the sense of you can look up and find out um, historic place names for a current place name. Because it's the kind of thing that commercial companies don't do. Even sites like GeoNames don't do very good historical names. Um, there's, no, there's nothing in it for them. So we need coordinated action. And we probably need some help in enhancing records too. Um, it's a lot of work to do, but there are a lot of experts out there. If you've ever worked anywhere that has um, history of technology collections, transport collections, military collections, you'll know that there are intensely expert people out there who will know more about specific aspects of the collection than any curator will. Because it's their hobby, it's, um, they can go really, really deep onto one thing without having to work on a hundred different objects for an exhibition. So I want to think about what would happen if more museums and libraries and archives opened up their data and if they published structured data alongside um, with clear licensing terms so you know whether you can reuse something or not. So this concept of the participatory commons is partly a provocation, it's partly a thought experiment, it's partly um, an attempt to force some kind of requirements engineering through action research. Um, and it's really, it's that bit in the middle, it's the, um, not strictly speaking, a kind of an actual platform that holds all the records, but it would reference things like the Internet Archive, it would reference Europeana, it would reference the Digital Public Library of America, of course it would reference Trove and Digital New Zealand. Um, so you've got all those records, but I think it also gives you the chance to pull in those shoebox archives because I really worry about the sustainability of these things. I think we're losing heritage, we're losing history. Every time someone moves house or the attic floods, um, and certainly in the UK as houses are getting smaller, people are kind of disposing of stuff. Um, and I'm curious about why more institutions aren't helping people preserve, at least by digitization as a proxy for preservation, looking after those records because it's a way of filling in the historic record that gets away from that sort of great white man view of history. So I said it's participatory. Um, it's not just a document store, it's not just a giant aggregator. Um, the idea is that it deals with a range of tasks that people can do on historical content. So the things that historians typically do, um, they'll assess and contextualize documents, um, things that sort of the public or more specialists, like people getting really into history, um, might be doing, like identifying people and places and events and kind of pulling those things out as notes and putting things into like tagging documents or saying these are ones that I'm interested in for this project. That's Arnie Margie's family history, whatever. Through to the kind of type what you see crowdsourcing activities, those micro tasks, transcribe text, tag this image. Um, and Andy said this morning that if it's not online, it doesn't exist. And I think that one thing that we can get from the personal record collections of historians is those archives that aren't digitized yet, because some of those historians will have records going back 40, 50 years. Um, and historians will kind of chase citations to particular archives, but if there's a way of saying, here are the notes that I made um, that at least give you a sense of what exists in that archive even if they haven't digitised their catalogues or haven't digitised the items. Um, it's a way of making those objects, those collections visible again. 
one thing about sharing content in this way is that it lets people follow their interest across collections. We've got this weird habit of um, our collecting histories influence what's in our collection. The same item could very easily be marked up as an archive record, marked up as an ephemeral item in a museum. It could be marked up as a printed catalogue in a library. In each case, we'll be treating it slightly differently. It'll be recorded differently. It'll be having a different meaning and different forms of access. Members of the public don't care about that. They don't really understand why a pamphlet about a village fate in 1898 has such different ways of being talked about. They just want to follow their interests through that village. They just want to find everything about that village. So thinking about a commons is a way of doing this. Um, you also need a critical mass of material to be discoverable. I think when I was looking for family, um, for these records of these soldiers, the way that um, the New Zealand and Australian records have been set up, it's quite easy to find things, but you do need to know which databases to go and look in as well. Um, so even having lots of content linking to each other, those kinds of virtuous connections will help the content be more discoverable in Google. Um, and the more experts that you have linking to your sites, recommending your sites, of course, the more discoverable they are. Um, researchers aren't always very sophisticated in how they think about resources. Um, museum catalogues are notoriously underused by researchers because they just don't think there's anything for them there. Um, so you have to be findable in search engines because otherwise you're kind of invisible. Um, so again, we want content to be indexed in time and space and not indexed by the institution that created the record. Sorry, there are two really bad visual puns in this. <laughs> so for most people, content is content. They just don't care which collection holds it. They just want access to it so they can get on with their research, they can get on with telling those stories about their lives. But I'm not suggesting one platform to rule them all. It's more like a kind of um, a Unixy, uh, small pieces loosely joined idea. Um, which is partly useful because it helps you respect the kind of messiness um, and the specificity of the records that you hold. You don't have to try and squish them into an aggregator and make them look the same as every other record, which is what you see in some of those sort of big Europeana and DPLA style aggregators. Um, so the participatory commons supports niche uses. The whole idea of having a platform is that you can build very specific focused interfaces on it that look at very specific questions. So it might be the history of a village, it might be the history of a family, it might be the history of an occupation. Um, it could be anything that you can think of. But these niche projects um, allow you to have more focused sets of content. They get away, that kind of, away from that flatness or that drabness um, that you get when you get these giant aggregators when you cannot find anything even though you know the records are probably in there somewhere. Um, Having this kind of idea of a participatory platform as a service means that you can tailor the interface to the data that you have. So if you're working on early modern England, the requirements for you are going to be very different than if you're working on 1950s Auckland. You want to design an interface that responds to the content and responds to the needs of the users. Um, so niche projects can help get through that sort of sense of wading through giant data sets as well. They also let you do things like tailor the functionality to the content. Um, so this is the obligatory shout out to Tim Sherratt. Um, uh, and I found this really useful in my own research, um, where I can do one search on his site and search all the Australian collections um, for World War I records. If every country had this, my life would be a lot easier. Um, and the thing that I love about this is it's a screen scrape. He didn't have to go to endless meetings and kind of agree on interchange standards and crosswalks and all this kind of stuff. It's just like scrape the content and search it that way. It's not perfect, but it is so much better than going to seven different databases, never quite knowing if you remember the right syntax for that search engine or if you're thinking of the other one and you've got it wrong. There's a lot of overhead in setting up participatory projects. There's managing user accounts, there's dealing with spam, there's dealing with people who've forgotten their password. Um, having a platform that has thought about these issues and has dealt with them in a way that responds to the task, so crowdsourcing text transcription, doing really complex research queries, um, means that you don't have to think about that kind of thing. I, do, I get a lot of people asking me about setting up crowdsourcing projects. 
And it's really hard to advise them because all the projects have a fair bit of really messy setup. Um, you need to wade into config files. You need to be comfortable setting up three different systems that all have to interlink in the right way. Um, the user experience is often not as good as it could be. So having platforms that take care of these things means that they can get on with doing the things that they do really well, and you can get on with just using them. Because um, I really don't want to under understate the amount of work it takes to get a good crowdsourcing project or to get a good participatory project. So there's something about getting specific that people respond to really well. People respond to place. People respond to time. They respond to topics. Um, and the idea of having these sort of niche projects built on top of a generic platform means that you can build that thing about ice cream shops and milk bars in 1950s Auckland if you want to. You can build a site about Teddy shoes. You can build whatever you like, because you can pull in the content that's been indexed and design an interface that suits exactly the kinds of tasks that you want to do. It also creates a possibility of having different kinds of tasks or different levels of responsibility. So one thing we know about crowdsourcing is that people get started on it. They love the puzzle of reading 17th century handwriting or even 19th, 20th century handwriting these days. Um, but once they get used to that puzzle, they kind of they get a bit bored because they've figured it out. They've got the knack of it. But if you can give them tasks to go onto that are more complex, um, that have a greater responsibility, that make a greater impact, then they'll stay involved and you can actually um, collaborate in some of those responsibilities with members of the public. It doesn't mean that you can hand everything over and expect they're going to do things for you. They're not a workforce. But it does mean that if people want to take up opportunities, then they're there to take up. Um, so I said it's a kind of, it's a provocation, um, it's a thought experiment. It's inspired by um, probably a very sort of social history view of history from below. Um, but I think there's something about this combination of a large underlying repository, the ability to pull in very local records, to pull in personal records, um, that makes it quite a powerful response to some of the larger um, digitization projects where it's you know, the classic 18th century white men, all their correspondence is digitized, and there's huge amounts of archives that have not even gotten any money for conservation. So if this is also ace, why isn't it happening? Um, I think people are still a bit protective about their content, um, but maybe it needs to be a bit more like you're sending your content off to a party. You know, let your content get out there and mix. Um, we've got the um, mashup competitions over here. There's, you guys are thinking about this already. Hopefully it's not too scary as a concept. Um, so there's a number of barriers. Um, and I'd love to know why people aren't taking on the challenge of digitizing these personal collections that people have, because I think we are losing them. Um, I'd love to see something like flying digitization squads or people in libraries training young people to get their first job out of school, to be digitally literate, digitizing people's records while they do this. I think it would be a great use of a local library or a local archive as that kind of real community space. I think we also need to think about the shoebox archive of today. It's a phone. Unlike you know, the documents in a trunk, phones can be dropped in the loo, they can be left in taxis, they can, you can be mugged. Um, you can, you've probably all had a friend who's lost all you know, their photos or their family holidays or whatever. It's not only that we're storing more and more of our lives in these devices, we're also storing more and more of our lives in other people's spaces. Um, so GeoCities, TwitPix, um, Posturus, They've all gone, and there are other services that will go too. And it could be your wedding photos, it could be your kids' first steps, it could be your granddad's last conversation. We're really at risk of losing some of these things. And I think um, thinking about how platforms might help you deal with legacy software, um, with archiving these things, talk to Bruce to get him to help you with that. OK. so. Copyright is not fit for purpose. It's not helping people get a livelihood from creating content. It's kind of having a stifling effect. We all know this. There's a lot of commercial pressure to privatize records. Um, and particularly in the UK, people see it as the only way that they can digitize content. But it means that things like newspapers are locked up for 20 years or 10 years. Um, and unless you can afford a subscription or get to London, you don't really have access to them. 
I think one issue is that the commons is a really crappy metaphor. Um, it's based on access to physical property and land. It's embedded in concepts of community, um, of particular types of use of land. So commons doesn't really grab people as a title. Um, we need to find better terms. This is me with the thesaurus trying to think about other terms. Um, I wanted a self-explanatory name, and so I did some focus group research. I went on Facebook and asked my friends, which of these terms mean anything to you? Um, and the nearest I got was collaborative collections. I really liked cooperative because I thought it had that kind of same sense of um, people working together, but it sounds a bit hippie, apparently. Fair dues. Um, so but all these terms, they're awkward to say. They're long. Um, there's nothing. We need a kind of short, snappy term that says something. So if you think of anything, let me know. Um, orphan works, certainly in the UK, up to 70% of um, records can't be put online because we don't know who the creators were. We don't know what rights are associated with those records, um, which is a crying shame because it's 70% of the UK's heritage that isn't available online. Um, there are big design challenges with designing for different audiences. Academic historians have very different reward structures and concerns than a vocational historians who are quite happy to share things generally as long as people treat their content with respect because it might be about their family. Um, as we start to get into these giant digital databases, we're creating privacy issues. So when you get to the point when you'll know everything about someone who lived 100 years ago by connecting different databases, it's not only their life that is suddenly exposed in a new way, it's the life of people around them, their descendants, um, people who are associated with them. And we, we don't really know how to deal with this yet. Um, aggregation flattens data. Um, I've tended to work in institutions with really nice granular data, but if you want to put it into a shared site, you have to kind of go to the lowest common denominator, which means things are less findable, they kind of, they lack that texture that the original records had. Um, and we get people who are afraid that putting their content on shared sites will cannibalise visits to their own site. I'd like to think the more people know about your content, the more people will use your collection. So maybe that's one of those battles that will go away of its own accord. And I think one thing we have to be aware of is if we don't do it, someone else is going to. Google's Cultural Institute have tools that institutions can use to put their content online. Um, I don't want to be all paranoid about Google, but we don't know exactly how long they'll sustain these services. We don't know how it fits into their business models. Um, the people working on them are individually great, but they are working for an institution with a sometimes problematic history. And then you get things like this. Have people seen history in pics and those kinds of sites? Um, I think they show the thirst for accessible, relatable images, but to me, they decontextualize records. They kind of go for the image that will viscerally grab you, or the image of, there's a lot of Marilyn Monroe on these sites. They're yanking content out of its time. They're taking it out of its context. They're presenting it purely as this kind of like flattened, yes, no, hot or not moment. Um, and I think that is subtly damaging to the historical record. And both of them, in picking out these highlights, undo the work that we think so carefully about in being representative, in thinking about communities, in thinking about the voices that we present, um, and it kind of goes back to this sort of um, great white heroes. So, how am I doing for time? Okay. Um, I'm currently working in Dublin at Trinity College. Um, I'm working on a project called Sindari. Um, and when I put in my proposal, I sort of basically decided to act as if the participatory commons already existed, because why not? It's one way to make it happen. Um, the Sindari project is aiming to provide historians with tools for contextualizing and sharing their research. So like me, they're very interested in how historians work, how it's changing with digital technologies, um, how technologies might influence people to share or collaborate a bit more. They have two areas of focus. One is around medieval documents, and the other is around World War I, because it gives them a range of um, the likely issues that they're going to encounter and a kind of coalescence around the concerns at either end of those periods. Um, and I have to say, doing a research fellowship for someone who's used to working on exhibitions or publications, it's amazing. There's no deadline at the end. 
Um, so it gives me time to experiment in the t you know, a way that I don't get to do in a day job. Um, so I was trying to sort of work simultaneously on the technical requirements and the cultural requirements for something like a participatory commons, um, as well as building a niche project that would help to test the reality of this kind of infrastructure. Um, it's a three-month project, so it's very squished, sort of less than ideal. Um, but that was you know, what I had to work with. So one thing that I wanted was um, a list of locally relevant names. So um, places, concepts, events, activities, um, things that were about World War I, because that's what I was working on. Um, and this is actually uh, Gallipoli, again, you can see that names like the farm, it's very contextual. You couldn't Google the farm and expect to get this record because it's such a generic name. Um, and these names are really specific. They came into very intense use for a very short period of time. They don't exist as places in things like Google. They don't exist as places in things like GeoNames. Um, they only exist in this very specific content of this sort of very specific cape at a particular moment in time. Um, and what I really wanted was for these names to be available as linked data so that I could link out to other things so I could say when I'm talking about the farm, I'm talking about the same farm as these records here. Um, and I wanted to be able to train sort of software to recognise these terms and to say, I, I understand that the farm here has a specific meaning, it's not just someone asking how the cows are doing at home. And I was going to do things like exploring crowdsourcing to see if you could get people to help check um, possible entity matches and, um, and see, you know, was the software doing well in recognising things or would it be better to get people to manually mark up these things. And I thought, you know, it's a centenary of the outbreak of the First World War, so naturally there'll be a lot of structured data because there are so many digitisation projects going on, there are so many participatory projects going on, everyone is you know, spending money and getting excited about the centenary. Um, so, well, naturally that would mean that there'd be a lot of structured data and a lot of records to play with. Um, it turns out there wasn't. Um, there's really, there's lots of little sites hosting diaries and letters. Um, they're all digitised in slightly different ways. There are national aggregators um, that have you know, you can only work with the items in your collection, so the State Library of New South Wales has a different collection than the Australian War Memorial. Um, so every time I want to sort of access these records, I have to find slightly different ways of doing so. Um, and they often have different ideas about what digitised means, so some of the um, New South Wales records that I can find in Trove look amazing and then I realise that they're so low resolution that I can't actually read the handwriting so there's no way that I can transcribe those documents or read those documents and get a sense of what was happening in that diary. Where others are very high resolution but you never quite know what you're going to get. We have um, big collecting projects like Europeana 1914-18 um, which looks like a massive um, treasure chest of personal accounts, diaries, letters, memoirs. Um, but when you start to look at the records, um, sometimes uh, not the whole thing hasn't been digitised or it's someone's only bought in you know, a couple of letters, they haven't bought in the whole set. Um, sometimes it's people who've transcribed them themselves and you know, generally you wouldn't trust someone else's transcription. Um, if you were going to rely on something as a source, you'd want to check for yourself that they've gotten the names right and the dates right and things. Um, and then you've got people who are painstakingly transcribing unit diaries, um, but they're not linked back to the Australian War Memorial site, so there's no way of knowing that actually someone has done all the work of transcribing all those pages. Um, and so the next poor sucker sort of sits there and um, retranscribes them or rereads them. So I kind of thought I'd be popping around the shops, buying some ingredients, and then making a really fancy dinner. But as it turns out, it was more like. Um, sowing a field, growing some wheat, grinding it up, making flour, and then finding some yeast and making bread. It's been a really painful, very manual process. And I think there are several reasons possibly for this lack of data. Um, often institutions doing these big digitization projects will promise an API at the end of it, but it's really easy for that to drop off the list of deliverables because 
People are never quite sure who's going to use it. They might not have been that convinced about it in the first place. Um, so these promised APIs or these promised open data sets just, just don't appear. Um, they never say that you know, they happen to live at it. It just doesn't happen. Um, and you get these amazing, amazing amateur historians or avocational historians um, and sort of special interest groups who do brilliant work producing finding aids, um, producing wikis that explain lots of things about these records. But they don't have the skills. If you think back to the, um, you know, the retired historians in the village who are using an Excel spreadsheet, that's really common. Um, like that's about as structured as people will get. And then the projects that have developed ontologies and structured data are really specific. Um, so they're kind of based around their very particular goals, um, their research question. So they've dev devised a vocabulary, a structured data set to talk about this and populated it with records that relate to this very specific question. So there wasn't a lot of data out there. So I kind of refocused on things that researchers needed to get started in looking at World War I histories. So my goal now at the end of this project is that someone who wants to research a soldier in World War I, um, who doesn't know anything about how armies are structured, can find a personal narrative from a soldier in the same bit of the army without having to understand exactly what the same bit of the army means. Um, so I'm trying to crowdsource the development of an ontology and populating it to deal with these really complex structured queries so that every single new historian doesn't have to try and figure out the difference between a battalion and a regiment and a division and a brigade and when people moved around between these different things. Um, so there's a kind of simpler crowdsourcing task which is to try and find a personal narrative for every battalion in the army. If I'd done my research and known exactly how many battalions there were, I might not have said battalion, I might have said regiment, um, because there are thousands and thousands of them. But people did have different experiences um, from different battalions in the same regiment, so I think it's worth trying to get there. Um, so if I want to know what life was like for the man on the left, because he's my great uncle, um, but he hasn't left any documentary traces, I'll take the diary of the guy on the right as being good enough. I'll say I will still learn something of his experience. There's always a gulf in terms of personal histories, sort of socioeconomic status. Um, you know, every, you know it, it's never going to be an exact proxy, but as some sense of what it was like to go through this incredibly intense experience, I'll take that. Um, but it's really hard to find this content online at the moment. So I'm trying to crowdsource the process of linking these personal narratives that exist out there to battalions. Um, and then there's a the whole geeky bit, um, which digital history sounds really sexy, but actually it's a lot of data entry. Um, so I'm trying to, I'm working with people that I've never even emailed, let alone met, um, to design and populate a data structure that will let you say things like, um, where, you know, where was the 27th Battalion in June 1915? You know, what was going on? What experiences were they having? By creating structured data that will support these questions. Um, I'm using a wiki for it, which is not ideal, but it was a kind of quick and dirty solution. Um, so the sense that I have is that, you know, people get excited about big data, but at the moment it's very much handcrafted data. You can't run these queries and easily get reliable data out because history is messy, where people are messy. Um, so I've been asking people to help me find a letter or a diary for each unit. And given that I haven't um, been able to work on it full time because I've been sort of working on all the technical aspects as well, it's slowly happening. So this is someone who added a record last night. Um, and I think it shows that a collaborative collection can provide the historical content that kind of has that um, specificity of the niche call. Um, I think there's also an emotional call here that helps with motivation, um, but it shows the power of the niche project. So coming back to this question of what could we create, I tried to create one tiny thing. I've uncovered all kinds of issues with it, but I think that process of working out exactly what's not there is useful because it means you've got a goal to aim for. So I think we should try and find out what would happen if we did this. I think New Zealand's institutions have already done a lot to open up. Um, there's a lot of really clever work that's been done. There's obviously really clever people here. Um, but it's up to you guys to keep pushing. 
um, to make something that is actually better than the better and bigger than the sum of your parts of your individual institutions. So thank you. Yes. Don't be shy. Um, we do have time for questions. Oh, there's one coming in the middle. Thanks, Peter. It's not a question. It's, uh, it's a comment. Your, um, I appreciate your difficulty with uh, finding a name for this idea, and I, I do like the word commons. I think it is exactly what you need. But I, but as part of our um, statewide. Um, World War I commemoration in Queensland, we started surveying all of the local history and local public mm -hmm. libraries. And we started off with this idea of what we called distributed collections. And we we're very um, roundly warned that it's not distributed because that implies that we were the centre. So we came up with a, a term that you might want to think about called connected collections. Mm, okay. Thank you. There's one down here earlier. I was just thinking like you were kind of saying um, history is messy so um, it kind of resists being big data. I wonder if that's just that not enough processing power has been thrown at it yet? Yeah, I mean almost the machine learning that's going on and the kind of computational deep processing, um, I think it even offers challenges for crowdsourcing because um, things like text transcription are going to be done computationally. But I think the kinds of judgments that people make about, it's really subjective. Um, so even things like uh, looking at the battalions and saying what's the official name of the battalion it probably changed four times during the war. Um, it's uh, the, um, the axe or the broom. It's like, you know, it's different units have come in and out of that battalion, so it's actually hard to say what the battalion really is in some sense. Um, so those kinds of philosophical, ontological questions um, still arise. Um, I actually like the mess. I think it's kind of, if we can work out ways of getting computers to do some of the grunt work for us, and then it's, it's always easier to kind of say, yes, that's right, rather than having to do the subjective thinking yourself. So if we get smarter about that kind of interaction between machine and us, then hopefully some of the grunt work will be done. Um, and even if you just sort of script up things and then have to tidy things up later, um, it's putting you further ahead than you were. I love the idea that we should build participatory models. Um, are there any examples that you think of, of of projects that have done sort of part of it or sort of could be used as, as maybe inspiring, if not the whole thing? Yeah. There's lots of bits that are kind of like it. Um, and I think even the, is it the Keto software here? Um, is doing some of it, but it's also thinking about um, having that kind of the um, trifecta of the three parts that have to be there, um, because you do have these big national aggregators that kind of will take on content from everywhere. Um, there's a kind of reluctance to deal with the community aspect and that community collecting aspect of it sometimes. Um, all the people who are doing that are really low to the ground and grassroots and don't have the capacity to think about the big things as well. So there's lots of little um, or big examples that could feed into lessons about what not to do and what to do and what's worked. Um, but it's, hopefully it's just a matter of kind of bringing them all together or creating links between things without actually reinventing any of it. Library of South Australia, all the missing person files for the Red Cross in 
South Australia, three and a half thousand of them. And what we're doing is uh, reminded of by your photograph of the two gentlemen in the boat. Those files are not only about the missing person, they've got information about the witnesses of the last people who saw them or saw them in hospital before they were blown up. We link that to the Imperial War Graves Commission, our photographic um, archives with the community it's been put online. People are putting faces to the names, to the records of the witnesses as well as the missing persons. And we're also linking it to the obituary pages in the newspapers. And it's rippling out across the whole community. So we've got uh, people from all over Australia whose ancestors were in South Australia and um, were recruiting um, joining into this project. We're thinking about 10 different sorts of records, mm. including those out in the community. And do you have any um, lessons that you could succinctly share in five seconds? <laughs> You've got to get the background infrastructure right first. And the other thing is you've got to get out there and promote it. So mm. we got a lot of television and radio and print on that, which meant people start coming to us. So you've got to tell the story. Yeah. I've just got an, um, an observation and then a question. Uh, it's interesting how often in the, the commonest common we resort to this term, the lowest common denominator, and we seem to forget the highest common factor which should always be the goal in these kinds of things. How can we get to the most, the highest level of commonality? And I think that's something your project really aspires to. Um, and it's important to remember that corollary to the lowest common denominator. Um, my question was in terms of motivating people who might be participants in crowdsourcing. Uh, is there much work being done? Have you thought of using digital badges as a motivation? So you might demonstrate a competency in 19th century handwriting transcription before moving on to uh, image identification, something like that. Is that something that's been done or that you're there interested in? There are many, in? many, many words written on the subject. Um, there's, because there's a long history of citizen science um, coming from that tradition of public participation in scientific research, there's a lot of um, thinking about what motivates people to participate in those kinds of activities. Um, there's a lot of work, some work on volunteers in the cultural heritage sector. Um, there's a lot of work on the kinds of learning that people get out of things. Um, and generally, when I'm looking at things, I group them into intrinsic, extrinsic, and altruistic motivations. Um, so the badge, badges, gamification, they all kind of fall into the extrinsic thing. Um, but there is something in the kind of micro-credentialing. So I think for historians to um, finding ways for different people with different concerns to get credit for the work that they're doing. So if someone shares documents from an archive, um, it, it might be that they don't actually have any interest in nursing records, but they've shared them because they happen to end up in the same box and they've photographed them. Um, but it would be great to give them a way to get some academic credential or to say, you know, this is someone who spent time in the archives, which is the mark of a historian. Um, but I think they need to be really carefully designed to match the motivations and interests of people, because um, it's a very tricky area. Oh, Pip, we've got one down here who's been hanging out for it, and then we'll come back up to, sorry, Rick, we'll come back to you very soon. Chris, over here. Thanks, I, I really loved that talk. Um, I was, I, I, there was a bit where you started riffing off Unix philosophy and you started talking about small ontologies lo loosely joined, and I was really taken by that, and then I started thinking that I don't really know what that means. Okay. And like, I thought in one breath it might be that you've got ontologies that are particular to specific collections, and you have really dumb links between those. And the other is that you might have ontologies and kind of crazy mappings between ontologies and turtles all the way down ontology, yeah. ontology, mapping, mapping, mapping. I was wondering if you could expand on, on what you meant by with that phrase, small ontologies, let's see, join. Okay. I think um, it's actually David Weinberger's phrase. Um, the, there's also Tim, something Tim Berners-Lee said at an event once. Um, for me, having worked for a long time in cultural institutions that were trying to get our data to go across things, so the Science Museum and the Wellcome Collection have a lot of items in common. Um, 
But that whole dream of the kind of follow your nose thing where, you know, when I say title, I really mean name, and when you say name, you mean title. Um, the way that our collections are based on decisions that were made 180 years ago mean it's really difficult to follow your nose because you'll just end up running into a wall. Um, so the idea is really that you do um, the vegetarian version, you drink your own champagne of eating your own dog food, you make ontologies that you need, you get the structured data that you need, and then you share them with people and find matches between things. Um, it's, and again, coming back to, you know, what, at some point machines are going to be able to make semantic inferences about meaning, but at the moment, it's a handcrafted process. So when I've worked on partnership projects, um, part of the, you know, the squishing down of the specificity has been about, we could say it's this particular street in Brentford, um, but someone else might be only able to say it's in the Council of Hounslow. So you kind of, you have to make sure that you design systems that will deal with that, that highest common factor as well. Um, and often people don't because it doesn't figure into the immediate user needs. But I think we need to be thinking about retaining as much of that specificity as possible. Um, so yeah, if you work, create your own ontologies and use them and make sure they work for the material that you've got and then try and linking out to other people's ontologies. Cool. We'll take one from Rick and then we might go and have a drink. So go ahead there as well. That was another one. Oh, go for it. Go for it. Okay. Um, I mean, int really interested in your comment that we we seem to be repeating the mistakes of the past in terms of the the difficulty which we've had or the lack of encouragement of people to digitise their own resources. So in the in the hard copy analog world, is this going on enough? Um, in the in the analog world, very difficult to encourage people outside the environs that we are here to spend time digitising their own resources and putting them up. And the fact that, that that lack is now being repeated in the online social media environment with, it seems to me, a real dearth of tools which make it easy for people to properly archive their own personal histories. Is there something out there that's being done about that? Um, well, I suppose the movement to have social networks that you can um, leave if you need to in that sense of if you let people leave then they'll probably not feel the need to leave so you can export your data from Twitter or you can export your data from Facebook it's a terrible archive if you've ever looked at it it doesn't really have any of the richness of the social relations um, there are some people who are really really keen to digitize things so something also about moving to Ireland where people kept telling me about these collections that they have that are amazing um, you know several centuries of house deeds or whatever that they've got um, and even for the World War I stuff, people feel a responsibility to do something with these records. You, you get people who merrily just kind of chuck out old documents as well. Um, so maybe it is something about sort of marketing the process in a way that says, you might not be interested in this, but this contains stories, this contains lives, these, these are traces of real people. Um, even if you don't care about them, you can share them and someone else will benefit. Um, but you know, we don't even protect our privacy when you, we use social networks. So that kind of hygiene of making sure that your data is okay is a whole other step above. And I guess there's no interest in the um, software companies or the social media companies for us to think about preservation um, because it's, it's boring. It's not as fun as tagging photos from Saturday night. Um, so unless there's, yeah, if it's hard, if it feels like it's going to be a drag, if it feels like it's not going to be um, usable or useful, then people won't do it. So it's a kind of marketing problem, I guess, in some ways. One last question up the back. He's got the microphone. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mia. Just uh, a question about the aggregators, the big aggregators that you mentioned, so the DPLA and Europeana, Trove, and even Digital New Zealand. How far away do you think they actually are from being platform as a service and, and participatory commons? And do you think that they could or will get there or will they stay as kind of digital takeaways? It's, so Europeana has something like a million lines of Java code. It's really hard for them to deploy new things. There's a kind of legacy. Um, they're definitely all exploring it, but I think they also, 
you know, cultural institutions are really chicken of the egg. Like, they need to see the demonstration that people will help um, transcribe things or that they will help catalog things or they'll do these things um, before they'll invest in making platforms. Um, but because they have open APIs, anyone else can pull in their records and do things. Um, but what I found looking at the uh, Europeana ones for the, um, the roadshow collecting days is that the records were in really odd format sometimes. Sometimes it was like an entire PDF and sometimes it was 72 individual JPEGs. And um, So some of their back-end systems are a work in progress, which I think it, it makes it hard for them to respond to these things. Thanks. Righty, well, let's, let's thank Mia for her talk today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um,